Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, a look at award-winning prison journalist Wilbert Rito and his quest for freedom. Our one-to-one -one segment features registered dietitian Barbara Dixon of Baton Rouge, who talks to us about nutrition, broadcasting, and being in the restaurant business. And in our Something Extra segment, Genevieve Stewart tells us about a unique job training program for women. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. Up front today, a very interesting story about a man who lives behind prison bars but is seeking his freedom. The man is Wilbert Rito, an award-winning journalist. Rito is currently serving a life sentence for the 1961 murder of a Lake Charles bank teller during a robbery. The Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola is home for thousands of hardcore criminals. For the last 24 years, it has been the home of 42-year-old Wilbert Rito. He is a robber and a murderer. But he is also a prize-winning journalist and co-editor of the prison's award-winning magazine, The Angolite. We try to uh, give you a realistic view of what prison is like because everything in prison is not violence. Everything in prison is not death. Everything in prison is not uh, necessarily bad or necessarily good. It's like life anyplace else. It's mixed. Rito says he is not the same man he was back in 1961 when he robbed a Lake Charles bank and murdered a bank teller. In 1979, he applied for clemency, but his application was turned down by the Louisiana Board of Pardon. Rito's case was recently before the pardon board again, and a lot of supporters were on hand, like Rupert Richardson, president of the Louisiana NAACP, who told the board that Rito is not dangerous to himself or society. But the biggest plea for Rito's release came from his mother, Gladys Simeon. Wilbert has been uh, away from home for 23 years, 10 months, and three days today. And I've been in a, a whole lot of struggles since then. People call, call me up and tell me they was going to burn the house. Park near the house and cursed and use all kind of languages. Call on the phone, curse me out and hang up. And I visit him all th through this time. And he often told me, he says, Mother, he said, I'm sorry for what happened and, uh, and have to put you through all this problem. And he said, if I can ever make up for it, he said, I will uh, show you different. And at that time, I had a baby three months old. And I visited him with her all through this time. And he's seen her grow up. She is now 24 years old. And every time I go visit him, I take her with me. And now uh, she is uh, doing for herself, and she visit him on her own now. And uh, I told my family that if I would happen to die before we would, that uh, never to let him know, because I never wanted him to come back to Lake Charles. Because people had too much bitterness in Lake Charles bars.
so I'm sorry not to be able to say more, but I thank each and every one that is here on his behalf. But there was also testimony from people who want to see Rito remain behind bars. The only reason I came here today was not to bring that up, but it was up, and I have to change my thoughts to tell you that the people that were taken into this crime, the victims of crime, which they brought up a moment ago, and I'm glad they brought the victims up, even in the Angle Eye. That's terrific. Those three people that were involved, including the dead one, Julia Ferguson, and while they talk about how long Mr. Rideau has suffered at Angola, the punishment, is it enough? I try to wonder when it will end for Julia Ferguson, who has been in the ground ever since the night of that thing in February 1961. I also try to think about the other two people that were left there for dead at the scene. What happens to them? I have never found, as a reporter, and I asked a lot of the immediate families that I could contact, they're so small. Who ever got a word from Mr. Rideau of remorse, regret, or sadness to them? I've heard the Reverend and all talk about how they expressed it, and if I was in Mr. Rideau's position at Angola, certainly I would be a very good worker, because that is a job that he's done well, and he's done it so well that they should keep him at Angola to set the example for the other fellows who don't care to try to do well. Rick Bryant from the Calcasieu Parish District Attorney's Office read this statement from Dora McCain, one of Rito's victims who survived the ordeal. Wilbert Rito was tried for murder by a jury three times and given the death penalty each time. I had to testify for the state of Louisiana and had to remember and relive the horrible experience at each of these trials. I went away from each trial with the assurance given by the DA and representatives of the state that he would no longer be a threat to me nor to society. Justice would prevail. Wilbert Rideau took a life, and he intended to take three lives. As the years passed, I hurt more and more from the bone fragments in my spine caused by the bullet he shot into my spine. And I hurt very much whenever I think of what my life would have been had he not kidnapped and shot me. I think of the things I could never do as a result of the gunshot, and I remember the horrible things that he did to Julia and me that night. I can never forget them. The bottom line is the fact that this man murdered another human being, and now he is credited with certain accomplishments. But do these accomplishments guarantee a murderer his freedom? Or did he forfeit his freedom when he cut Julia's throat that night and ruined our lives? But after nearly two and a half hours of testimony and about 15 minutes of deliberations behind closed doors, the pardon board voted unanimously to recommend that Rito's sentence be commuted from life to time served. Pardon board chairman Howard Marcellus explains how he arrived at his decision. There was no one, there was no one specific thing. It was a compilation of all of it. As we all arrive at decisions, you listen, you hear, you weigh, and at some point in time you look at the two of them and you say, I'm going this way. And that's how I arrived at my decision. I decided that, I felt that as someone said, if not now, when? And I felt that I answered that question. I think now was the time. And I voted accordingly. Riddle's mother had this reaction. Unbelievable. What do you think was the overriding factor for the unanimous vote? Let's see, repeat. What do you think made them decide unanimously to allow for commutation pending approval? Well, I think that he had uh, proven himself to be much different, and he wasn't the same person that he was at that time. Can I ask you again, Ms. Sumner, how you feel about this? Did, did you think it could really happen? Well, I did think it could happen. All I've done was to uh, pray to God that some days that whenever times would be set right, that it would happen. I just put it in God's trust. So how do you sum up the way you feel right now? I'm all excited. Now, the pardon board's recommendation was sent to Governor Edwards, but the governor decided not to free Rita. Meantime, the award-winning journalist remains hopeful that the governor's decision is not irrevocable and that some compromise can be reached. It's time now for our one-to-one -one segment, which today features registered dietitian Barbara Dixon of Baton Rouge, who gives us a short lesson on nutrition. We begin our lesson at the Dixon Medical and Nutrition Clinic, which Barbara owns and operates with her husband, Dr. Henry Dixon. I, 
I think it's the basis of health. I don't think we take it serious enough because we wait until we get a, a particular symptom before we say, oh, this is a health problem that I have. If we would use uh, nutrition in the terms of prevention or preventing diseases, then it takes on a no another meaning altogether. I mean, if we look at it as being a basis of good health, what we eat uh, generally refre reflects you know, what our health outcome is going to be. And I think that unfortunately by the time we become seriously ill and we have to make changes in our health as medical science dictates, then it does not even become fun. But nutrition can be fun, it can be exciting, and it can be a part of everyday life and feeling better, living longer. So what type of person goes to see a nutritionist? Well, first of all, I want to defunct the idea that it's all overweight people because I think when people think of going to nutritionists, they say, well, you know, can you help me lose weight or can you help me gain weight? Basically, I say 90% of my practice is made up of typically healthy people that you see walking around who go to the spas, who jog, who want to remain that way. I have them from very, very young because I see children also from the hyperactive children that we hear of today to the 65-year-old who's out running three miles a day and wants to stay healthy and looking good. So it's a broad range. I think from uh, population-wise or race-wise, most of my patients still, however, uh, tend to be white. I sometimes uh, feel that the black population often needs a lot of help, and yet they're not quite as aware of health issues or they don't take them as seriously. Um, as some of my other patients. It used to be a question, too, of affluency. You know, was it that people who had a lot of money to spend on their health or to spend on nutrition typically went to a dietitian? And poor people who really often need the help badly often miss out. And I still see that. I still see a trend toward the affluent, the ones that are really, really active, uh, and the ones that are reading, and the ones that typically don't have a whole lot of health problems. What could a person look forward to, let's say, in an initial visit to you? Look for a lot of questions, um, and above all, to spend a lot of time with me. Uh, a lot of people come into an office, whether it be a doctor's office, and they expect to spend five minutes, maybe the physician not remembering their name, what the illness was. It's quite different with me because I like to get to know my patients very personally, uh, I'd like to know a lot about their previous histories, what problems have they had, their families have had. Uh, I start, I guess, way back from infancy. Uh, I do ask, uh, and I do, they do write a lot of questions. Uh, they fill out a questionnaire over about 140 questions even before they get to see me. So they're going to spend about 15 minutes in the waiting room filling out my forms. Then by the time I get them back, I the picture begins to come together and by the time our first interview is over which takes about an hour to an hour and a half the next time I see them I have a lot of data I have lab information on them and I can am better equipped to discuss their health problem in a in a wide fashion not just saying here's a body here what's wrong I think I have a very good picture of what somebody's life is about and um, their health. Not only does Barbara preach nutrition at her clinic, but she has also taken her message to television. Found that people were genuinely interested in nutrition. Again, it was a field that, um, as I considered, like other people, that here was a professional that was stuck behind um, uh, a kitchen uh, cabinet that was tasting foods in a pot. And all of a sudden, I think, uh, in the 70s, in the early 70s, people did begin to ask questions. And we began to get them in the media, and with very few dietitians with an expertise in television, it became whoever's brave enough to do this. So as I said before, I got shoved into it in a way, and then I became an old ham, and I loved it. And I do now because I, I feel that it's a good uh, means of communicating. I can communicate with much more, a wide variety of people, uh, for those people who can't afford to see me otherwise, so they think, then I can reach them. If I've just answered one question that they've had in their minds, or if I can change them from eating sweets or, you know, a desserts, or if I can cut down or help them cut down on the amount of sodium in their diets, then 
I've reached, if I reached one that had written me a letter, then I've reached a thousand others. So I think that its rewards for me is that it's um, much more far-reaching uh, a part of me and a part of my practice. So it's, it's natural with me now. I love it. What kind of reaction have you gotten from your viewers? Great. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that the reaction is great now and uh, things have changed in nutrition, as I said. I get a lot of letters. Uh, I get people writing out of state, which is surprising because we feel like no one else sees us other than people in our state or in our neighborhoods. And that simply has not been true. Nutrition has reached, uh, and my topics have reached um, a wide variety of people who are in hotel rooms that are passing through Baton Rouge and it makes me feel good because it means that what I've said is significant enough that people will stop and pay attention and it's touched something in their lives. In addition to her private practice and broadcasting career, Barbara and her husband recently opened their own restaurant where they serve a unique combination of po' boys and health foods. My husband had always wanted a po' boy restaurant. He loves po' boys and uh, we do eat out a lot, as a lot of Amer Americans do. But we found that it was less and less uh, restaurants that we could go in, and if we felt like eating something different, that we could eat something different, or that it would be safe, or that we didn't have to deal with the additives and preservatives if we didn't want to. And I wanted a health food restaurant, so we compromised. So we have a po' boy health food restaurant where you can get sprouts on your po' boy, and you can get a glass of carrot juice with that, or you can get a salad, or you can get homemade soup. And so we cover people who are vegetarians and those who generally just want a nice big po' boy. And the next time they come in, they can try our yogurt pie. So it's um, appealing to uh, a wide variety of people, but yet getting them hooked on a different kind of food, too. What does the future hold for Barbara Dixon? Well, again, I think that... My, um, my goal lies in, in teaching and in communicating because I re it's something that I really enjoy doing, and I mean on a larger level. I can see for myself that I'll be doing a lot more lectures, you know, for the public because I really do enjoy it. So I see more of the same. Um, I see that I'll need some help, too. <laughs> I see as far as spreading myself as, as thin as I, as I am, uh, but I think that communication seems to be where I'm, I'm headed. By the way, the folks production team and I tried out the strawberry yogurt pie at Barbara's restaurant, and I'm here to tell you that it was absolutely delicious. If you're ever in the Baton Rouge area, I suggest you check it out. It's time now for our Something Extra segment, which this week features a unique job training program for women. Here's Genevieve Stewart. The governor has proclaimed this the year of the woman. Needs are being addressed with a renewed emphasis. That is because the economic and parental responsibilities of women have increased greatly in recent years. Female heads of households who are unskilled have been relegated to the ranks of poverty or near poverty. There is a program, small though it may be, that is having a positive impact on the plight of these women. It has captured the attention, interest, and imagination of women across the state. Marla McCain is director of the Skills Training Program under the Division of Women's Services. She described the curriculum and rationale for such training. The Skills Training Programs, we have two. There is one in New Orleans and there is one here in Baton Rouge. And these tr programs, what they do, they train and place women. We are charged with the responsibility of training women in technical areas and working to place them in blue-collar or technical-type jobs. Uh, the training classes are very regimented. The courses are designed to give them an introduction to basic electricity, wiring, circuitry, blueprint reading. Um, the women are taught first basic mathematics and go all the way through calculus. But at the completion of the training, they are able to enter, to, to access to entry-level jobs in plants, in warehouses, um, with construction companies, offshore, working for perhaps cable television companies as installers. We're looking for women who really want to and enjoy working with their hands, who don't mind physical work, and who have realized that they may be in a dead-end job, because these jobs traditionally pay 
two or three times greater than white collar jobs. Um, the training programs also address fitness. Fitness is a very important part and it is a part of the daily routine. It is a class because to successfully maintain a blue collar type job, you have to be in good physical shape. And it doesn't matter how big and how small you are, you just have to be in good shape. So that's an important part of the training program. Finally, we address, well, overall we address the total development of the woman, but finally we address all of those things that affect her ability to work well on a job. And by that I mean those things that affect her at home, uh, in her personal relationships, time, stress, children, managing home, and managing work. We work with women so that they can manage those things so that they can be good workers because industry wants good workers and that's more than you would, you know, we would ask of anyone. So we work with them so that they can manage these things so that not only can they get the job, but that they can keep the job and move up and advance themselves. Is this something that you would recommend to other women, to your friends? Definitely, if they think they would like to work in a non-traditional field. Of course, it's not for all women, but I think as you know in your heart what you can do and what you can't do. And if they're interested in working, you know, it's hard physically. The program itself has been hard for a lot of us, you know. It's been uh, quite a different change, you know, from what we were used to. But we've gotten so much out of it. Uh, yes, I would recommend it. Since its inception in 1981, the program has placed over 1,000 economically disadvantaged women in high-paying blue-collar jobs. According to recent government statistics, Louisiana has 73,000 female-headed households. 42% of them fall below the poverty level. For households with children under age 6, 63% are living in poverty. In three years, this program has taken over 1,000 women off the government dole and into the hands of industry anxious to utilize their skills. What do you intend to do when you graduate? Work. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully get a job. We've, we've got high hopes. You know, and the way we feel right now, I think we're all going to get placed. Power of positive thinking. Very much. An overwhelming majority of the program's graduates have been highly successful, both in job placement and retention. For some, the adjustments to the rigors of a blue-collar job and balancing a family life have been smoother than for others. Marla McCain theorizes on why this is the case. We found that many of our success stories reflect a very strong support system at home. Many of our women who are successfully placed, who successfully complete the training program, have good assistance with families or friends. They have formed a support network of, of anybody and everybody who can help them once they have entered the training, completed the training, and get a job. And by that I mean that if if the boss tells them they're going to have to work an extra shift, they have someone to call to say, can you pick my little baby up from the babysitter and keep them or take them to my mother's house? Uh, many of our clients in the training programs, if they're experiencing some difficulty with some of the technical instruction, they either know someone or know of someone who can help them. Do you find yourself helping one another, even outside the classroom? Constantly. We almost didn't get over our holidays because we kept the phones hot. You know, we couldn't wait to get back to school, just uh, to be back together again and uh, help each other with any problems that come up. We know that there's always one we can call. How do you feel about volunteer support from the various women's social and civic groups all around the state? Oh, most definitely. We, we feel that various women's groups, those are the people, those are the people that can help us most because uh, frequently they have access to or are resource, resources themselves. They can serve as role models for many of our clients. They have the technical expertise that we need to get our messages across to to the private sector of business and industry so that people in Louisiana, the citizens of Louisiana can truly appreciate what women, especially women who are living in poverty or below the poverty level, who are heads of households, who are battered, um, 
who want to retrain, who want to gain a new skill, who want to re-enter or who have to re-enter the workforce, we need for the public to really appreciate, you know, what these people are going through because uh, women are becoming more and more a very potent political force, a very potent economic force, and, and people need to be educated as to what we have to offer and what we can do. And we feel that various women's groups are, are, have unlimited resources, the talents, the skills, the expertise that these various groups have, I'm sure many of them or most of them can offer us a lot of assistance in what we're doing in our respective programs. We've reached potentials we didn't ever thought we would, you know, when, because of the length of the program. We didn't think we would be able to do as much in a short length of time, and we've accomplished a lot, and we're not through yet. Well, that just about does it for another week here on Folks. Thanks for watching. Next week, a historical look at Jews in Louisiana. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>